as okay. always. Um, your father came from Italy. Yes. Uh, Dad left home. Uh, he was 14 years of age. Uh, gee, I don't know what, if he had any formal education at all. Leaving home at, at 14, mm -hmm. you know, he was only... Uh, and I remember him describing running through or going through the Simplon Pass into France and uh, his sister and brother-in-law uh, were living in uh, Merkel, Utah, which was a gold uh -huh. mining town. Uh -huh. And I just found out uh, the other day that uh, he went through Ellis Island mm -hmm. and oh, then a train to uh, Merkel, Utah, where he worked in the uh, silver mines. In fact, I have a picture of him going in, going into the mine. And uh, my uncle owned the only saloon in town. <laughs> <laughs> and so Dad uh, remained there for a few years. Uh -huh. And uh, then when these, I don't know why, evidently whether the silver ran out or the reason for moving to Canaan, uh, but there was the mining industry here in Canaan, and he knew, evidently knew the family, mm -hmm. uh, a Mrs. Grissetti, who would eventually be my, uh, the midwife that delivered me. Oh, really? Is that uh, the lady? At home. Uh -huh. And this woman is 90 to her 93 years old, and I was with her this weekend. Oh, so were you? Oh, we were, gee. She was telling me a lot of the family history that uh, I didn't know. Oh, that's neat. So that, um, anyway, my dad uh, went to work for Barnum Richardson, I believe that was mm -hmm. the name of the company at the time, and he worked at the uh, as a kill tender uh, here at this uh, mm -hmm. lime kill up the street. And he lived in one of the Barnum Company uh, homes uh -huh. here in uh, on the lower road. Uh -huh. uh, evidently, the Grissetti family knew that my mother my mother wanted to come to the states, mm -hmm. so they made a match, and evidently she was brought over here for the purpose of marrying my dad, who she had never met. So they were married. I. I think somewhere around 1910, 1911. Uh -huh. And uh, they moved from one room to the other, or one house to the other, rather, mm -hmm. as the family grew. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and uh, I think around 1920, he built the family homestead. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a house, and I think that was mm -hmm. about it. Uh, mm -hmm. There, I, and I believe there was electricity, but there was no plumbing, mm -hmm. no running water. Uh, we had a pump uh, in the kitchen with a dug well. Mm -hmm. And then in the washroom, there was another pump that pumped water from a cistern that was built under the house. Mm -hmm. In fact, he built a couple of uh, cisterns because... Uh, we had two cows and a couple of pigs and mm -hmm. uh, chickens, and we needed mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. So he built a cistern uh, and was gravity-fed into the cow barn. Oh, neat. So they had uh, had plenty of water. It was all uh, rainwater. It was all rainwater, uh -huh. of course. And uh, this was probably what we might consider a humble beginning, but I think at the time... Uh, it was considered that he was doing pretty well. Well, I was going to ask you uh, um, about how many of the Italian families were able in the early days to get property of their own and, and set yeah. up homes like that. I really don't think there were very many at the time were building their home at that time. Uh, I know that I remember several others being built. Ned Delone's house mm -hmm. uh, next door, the Demolino uh, bungalow. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Zucco, who was more or less the, well, she was the leader of most of the Italians in that mm -hmm. little area that we referred to as Rose Hill. Her house is uh, mm -hmm. a little older, but I think most of them date back to the, between 1900 and mm -hmm. 1910. Mm 
that they were built. Was that the period when most of the Italian families came to Canaan, do you think? I would think so. The early 1900s? Yes. I think the Segala family and uh, uh, the Eustacos. The My dad came to this country with the um, Spadassinis, mm -hmm. who your name probably you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. They were next-door neighbors in uh, Domodossola in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they didn't come to this country together, but uh, I think probably was one of the reasons why uh, my dad came to Canaan. The Spadassini owns the farm that um, Henry Taylor owns now. Uh -huh. That was the original Spadassini farm. Uh -huh. Up on, is that Locust Hill? Locust Hill. I see. Right. Uh, they had a big farm. Mrs. Fabriello. Uh huh. As a Spadassini. Of course, the more Italian families you got in town, the more people would tend to come here as they oh, yes. left their homes in Italy. I think that was a reason for it. They yeah. were friend, they were comfortable being with friends and people mm -hmm. that came from their area. Mm -hmm. um, in my mother's case, quite a coincidence, but her next door neighbor in Italy ended up being her next door neighbor oh, here in East Canada. Funny. And it wasn't planned, but it just worked out that way. When my dad left the, the last uh, company home to the house that he built, Mr. Brogy moved in to the, that home that my mother left, and they were next-door neighbors. Isn't that funny? And I don't, I don't know what the reason for it. There made a, must, could have been arrangements made, but uh, I'm not sure. So they... They settled in the East Canaan section of town then, uh, and that's the predominant area for the Italian families to have settled in, do you think? Uh, I think so, although the Segala family settled in Canaan, I believe. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a large Italian community in East Canaan, along with uh, several Irish families, mm -hmm. the Turneys, uh, the Strattons, mm -hmm. and a few others. Of course, they worked for the railroad. That's why mm -hmm. they were they were here. Mm -hmm. the, the Irish Stratons were more the, railroad people. The the, uh, the Strattons were owned mm -hmm. the general store, uh -huh. but the Turneys were. He was the foreman of the railroad. Now your home was up on um, Route Forty Four. Route Forty Four. Kind of on the Canaan end of East Canaan, right? Uh, that's right. We used to. There was an imaginary line we would consider, you know, where Laurie Gay lives, uh -huh. between Laurie Gay and Fat Seven. That was the borderline between East Canaan and <laughs> <Really>? Canaan. <laughs> that was it. You didn't <laughs> didn't necessarily cross that border. Of course, we did. We didn't have to. We had uh, everything right here in East Canaan. We had all, our friends, uh, our school, our uh, our post office, our general store, uh, grocery store, ice cream parlor. Wow. And. Uh, very seldom went to Canaan, uh, occasionally walked to a movie. Or, it really uh, was a separate community sure. then. It wasn't just uh, the kind of uh, imaginary division that we have today. Uh, no, it was, in fact, I know uh, the, they had the East Canaan Congregational Church, mm -hmm. and uh, St. Joseph's Church had religious instructions and um, Good Friday services and it was every Friday, I guess, uh, in a little house. Uh, well, it's torn down now. In fact, we lived in it uh, for a short time, I understand, uh, going up uh, towards the gravel pit. Uh huh. O'Connor's gravel pit. Uh -huh. There was a little house there. So there, there was that, kind of a mission service to East Canaan. Yes, it was. <laughs> so they came to East Canaan <laughs> because it was difficult for the uh -huh. East Canaan people to travel to Canaan. Uh, they didn't have cars in those days. My dad drove to work on a bicycle mm -hmm. and worked for uh, Ives and Pierce after he left uh, Barnum Richardson. What did he do at Ives and Pierce? He delivered feed, coal. Uh, the Ives and Pierce was bought out by community service, mm -hmm. uh, I think in the late 30s. Mm -hmm. That building is torn down. Is now the parking lot. In, in the oh, that was the grain building in the center of town. That's it. Okay, yeah. I always got that one confused with the one that was farther north that Fuller had. But I remember it oh, had no, no. kind of a raised platform. That's right. That's right. That was the uh, original Ives and Pierce feed mill. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, it fits into place, doesn't it? 
Now, your your dad delivered these materials around town. I presume he must have done that in a truck. They must yes, have. yes. I have to tell you a little story about my dad. In fact, I rode with him occasionally in the truck because, you know, you didn't very often have the opportunity riding in a car. But I, uh, down in Green Acres, uh, Lawrence Rinaldi had just built uh, a row of houses on there's now Lawrence Avenue, and the garages were underneath the houses, and many of the people had their coal bins in the garage. So my dad thought, well, gee, it would be, would be much easier if he drove back his truck into the garage and then to unload the coal. He wouldn't mm -hmm. have to carry it that far. Of course, he didn't realize once he unloaded the coal, the springs of the trucks would mm -hmm. go up and the cab of his truck became stuck in the, the garage. So he had to put the coal back onto oh, the truck no. again <laughs> to get the truck out of the was garage. The, <laughs> was that coal loose? I mean, did he have to shovel they were, it? They were in bags, and he dumped it, but he had to shovel it back onto the oh, truck. Oh, my gosh. To get it he had to <laughs> shovel it back into the bags and then, uh, oh. On, oh. Onto the truck, and uh, so they'd get the truck out. <laughs> oh, did he... He had to fill each of those bags then for each delivery that he made? Well, I think he may have done a little shoveling and just threw it in the back of the truck. <laughs> he had an Italian temper, you know, so that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet he was just absolutely... <laughs> yeah, ready. he was livid. <laughs> <laughs> he was a very hard worker, by the way. I'd have to uh, bring that up. He worked very hard. He'd be up at sunrise. Uh, he would have the cattle to take care of, the pigs, the chickens... Uh, and in the summertime, he would, by hand, with a sigh, uh, cut enough uh, hay uh, before going to work for Ives and Pierce, where he would deliver feed and coal and unload gondolas of coal by hand. Wow. They didn't have the automatic hoppers in those days. They had to be unloaded by hand into a bin uh, off the side of the uh, of the uh, coal car. That must have been such hot work. Oh, he, and then when he came home, again, he'd have to milk the cows, feed the animals. Uh, the children would have the hay raked in the mounds, and he mm -hmm. would bring it into the um, hay barn, pitchforks at a time. Wow. <laughs> Pitchforks at a time. He yep. didn't have a cart or anything. Occasionally, to Ives and Pierce would let him bring the truck home, and uh -huh. uh, we'd look, put the hay on the truck and then bring it in. But that didn't happen too often because he didn't want to bore the truck uh, too much. My word. What a lot of work. And then building the home, too, because he must have had most of you by the time he actually built the home, didn't he? There were. I had four sisters and a brother who were born before... Uh, he built a home. I was born in our, uh, what is now our present homestead there. And uh, the, my, the midwife describes it, described it to me this weekend. My mother went into labor, so all the children gathered in the kitchen downstairs, and she helped deliver me. Without the doctor, Dr. Mm -hmm. Penny from Norfolk didn't get there mm -hmm. until the next day to sign the certificate and to say, fine, he's a healthy baby. <laughs> but uh, after I was delivered and after the all guest the preliminary cleanup work was done, uh, she called my sisters and my father upstairs. And uh, he was so happy, she said, your father kissed me first before he kissed your mother. <laughs> 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 you, you say your sisters and your uh, father, your brother didn't live then. They were, they were alive at that time. Yes, uh -huh. I was the last one uh -huh. that was born, and I was born at that uh, family home. Uh -huh. I don't think any of them, they're all the, ch all the uh, children at the time were all born home, uh -huh. I would oh, imagine. No, I was thinking about your brother. Was he? He was born at home, but I, I'm, I believe it was the house across the uh -huh. street. Uh -huh. But he only lived uh, three or four months. Yeah, uh, he was. And, uh, you know, um, most of the ladies at that time didn't have the benefit of medical mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. I think very few ever saw a doctor unless there was a real problem. And uh, as I say, even at my delivery, the doctor came the following day to sign the, uh, then only to sign the certificate. <laughs> Coming and going, no doubt. The doctors. girls were tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the men were too, they had to be. 
They must yes. have been to work that way. And your poor mother dealing with all of those kids in a yeah. home without a washing machine. Without, oh, I always <laughs> wash the clothes by hand. In fact, I still have the copper tub that I'm using uh, that we, my mother used to boil the clothes in when she washed them on a, uh -huh. an old kerosene stove. Wow. My mother tells about you know, doing clothes by hand when we were kids. We, we tend to forget how recently, I like to think of it sure. as recently, uh, that sort of thing was still going on. Mm -hmm. Mom always talks about cars being put up on blocks in the winter. Always block, put the car away in the wintertime, sure. Uh, well, I, I know one problem was the defroster. You didn't have a defroster. Oh, I never so thought of that. So if it was cold, you couldn't see. So they had all, they had put a can on the dash, uh, <laughs> I love rub it. it with onions to keep it from freezing, you know, have a layer of onions in it. Oh, I don't So they tried everything it. to keep the windshield clear, otherwise you just couldn't see. Oh, that's amazing. I never thought that's about that. That's one of the that. problems we had. And of course, no snow tires or anything like that. You oh, no, no. That was before defrosters and snow tires. <laughs> <laughs> And I th probably before antifreeze, because I think they used straight alcohol. Oh, crazy. Of course, the Italians wouldn't have any problem with alcohol, because most of them made their home, own home brew, so there's plenty of it <laughs> around. <laughs> Not the kind you want to put in your car, though. Well, the straight al it came out almost as straight alcohol. <laughs> uh, uh, I, can, I can remember it was... Uh, would be, what, 160 proof as it would come out of the, the still. Bad. That's... Uh, that's enough to yes, kill you. Yes, 160 is what, uh, almost 100 proof. Yeah, 200 proof is 100 percent. Yeah. My word. Sure. <laughs> That'd be enough to put you in the hospital. That, that would be another little project my father would have. They have to make their own wine. Uh, we had a huge burial in the basement where the uh, the wine. We'd all have to go in and stomp on the wine. That used to be a Wonderful time, you know, take <laughs> shoes off and go in and pedal in the in the big wine barrel. Oh, that's and, amazing. Uh, we made, my dad, uh, Ned DeLone, had a cider mill. Uh -huh. So everybody had their couple barrels of cider. Which and got pretty hard, I suspect. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get the grapes for the wine? Well, Ned DeLone uh, supplied grapes to Italian families. And then a, uh, a fellow who started the store down in the hole, as we mm -hmm. referred to it, uh, Pilati Nanny, uh, started the East Canaan uh, General Store, and he would supply grapes. They were locally grown then? Oh, no. They would be near... Uh, they had to be very careful. You had to have the right mixture. New York mm -hmm. State grapes, California grapes, mm -hmm. to make the right wine. You just couldn't use uh, the same local grapes. Some local grapes were were used, but not too mm -hmm. many. So they would they would purchase grapes then. They would purchase grapes. How, <laughs> this is a funny question, but how many grapes does it make take to make a barrel of wine? Oh, I have no idea, but I do know that we would buy grapes not b by the bag, but by the ton would be a half a ton or a ton of grapes. And uh, so there would be a lot of grapes you'd have to buy to fill this huge barrel. The barrel was uh, probably 10 or 12 feet deep. Wow. And three or four feet around. In fact, I think it was put together in the cellar because we'd never get it through the cellar. Wow. Cellar. And we had to dismantle it, I remember, to take it out of the cellar after my parents passed away and we put in a heating system and so uh, you can't make home brew and wine and have a heating system because your cellar has to be cold. So, the, <laughs> so that came first. <laughs> we had to keep our priorities That's straight. That's right. You know, you had your salami and your sausage in the cellar and you couldn't very well have heat down there because the, the mold wouldn't form. and. <laughs> So you had, that was really like a, a small store in your own cellar. You had your, your oh. homemade brew and your homemade sausages oh, yes. and, and everything. Your mom, yeah. of course, would be manufacturing all of those salamis and whatnot. Uh, oh, yes. that would in the, Every fall, the animals would be butchered. And a, a, oh, all day Sunday or on a weekend would be set aside 
making uh, salami sausage and uh, to put in the basement. And the neighbors would get together and all help each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, the children of the neighbors would be outside having a having a good time, you know, playing ball and what have you. So always looking, always something to look forward to. That was a fall festival, so, oh, so to speak. Oh, it sure was. That's well, great. there would be a woodcutting weekend where a Mr. Stefanetto with his uh, portable sawmill would come to saw the wood up into small pieces uh-huh. so you'd have wood. You'd have a sausage-making weekend, and then you'd have a wine-making weekend so that uh, there was a lot of occasions to get together and, and have a good time. No need for television or movies or anything like that. Uh, and you say the children would just all gather and play while the adults were doing this. And, yep. And can you remember some of the games that you played or the kinds of activities that you engaged in? Oh, very simple games as I remember. We didn't have any. We didn't have the equipment that kids find necessary today. If we had a ball and a and a stick, that would be about it, I guess. We played a lot mm-hmm. of stick ball. I remember with broom handle and an old tennis ball. That uh-huh. was a, that was about it. And a tag, hide and go seek, kick the can, uh-huh. and this sort of thing. And uh, we didn't need to actually didn't need any equipment at all. I have a um, a little argument going over at work right now because Salisbury is thinking of putting up a fifty thousand dollar playground, if you huh. can believe it, in a town that's already got two playgrounds, and they're they're looking for volunteer money to do yeah. this. And I'm saying. Well, how about hospice and how about sure, the fire yeah. companies and things like that? And somehow it seems to me that if you turn children loose with a stick and a ball, <laughs> you know, that Children. they will do just as well as they do with a $50,000 playground, and perhaps better. They would use their imagination mm-hmm. a little more. Uh, uh, something with a playground, uh, so you come attached to a swing. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather be attached to a friend that I'm going to have a catch with or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't think it's necessary. I, at least, as far as I'm concerned, from my experience, uh, an expensive playground isn't necessary. An open field mm-hmm. with an opportunity to run and play is uh, about all you need. Tree to climb here and there, and that's about Indeed. it. Indeed, I think so. That's my conceit anyway, that I like that kind of thing. So um, tell me... Um, Tell me about the the social patterns of young people there, other than the times when you would get together with your parents. Where did where did young people meet in East Canaan, or did they meet? Oh yes, uh, in East Canaan we met at the uh, Veterans Memorial uh-huh. in the center of town, uh, Stratton's General Store uh, had candy, the post office was there, uh, Annie Turney uh, had an ice cream parlor. Uh-huh. Uh, there, uh, there was a, a, a small area to roller skate. In fact, we would roller skate on the main highway to get there. There was very, <laughs> very little traffic, so that, uh, in fact, believe it or not, that you were talking about playground. The area around that monument was a football field, and oh, I can wow. remember playing football with uh, Rose Hill against Dogtown. <laughs> or Allendale against Cinder Valley, you know. <laughs> we each, each section had its little... Uh, we were Rose Hill, by the way. That's the nicest name <laughs> of the lot that you came up with. Well, we named them. We gave them the names. Why not? <laughs> Cinder Valley was the lower road uh-huh. here. Uh, Dogtown was the area from the uh, East Cannon Post Office going towards Norfolk. Uh, uh-huh. East. How did that get its name? Do you remember? Dog, well, I don't know. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Probably some awful thing the kids Probably, thought up. <laughs> I don't remember. And then there was Allendale. Uh huh. That one's obvious. That was uh, was obvious. And of course, that number five school. We didn't. Uh, there was no contact between our school and number five school. Which was number five? That was up the one up in uh, where the Yale barn. Yes, mm-hmm. that was the old schoolhouse. That was mm-hmm. number five. Mm-hmm. So that actually we didn't come in contact with uh, any of the students at uh, number five. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had our own little area there, and uh, we went to the East Canaan School. What was that, number one or two? That was number two, wasn't it? I don't 
The really snow, the East Canyon Package Store? Uh-huh. I think it was number two, but I'm number not two. sure. Uh, so you, Canaan was number one. Yeah, it must have been number two. Must and have been number and two. Paul Allen went out to number five. Number five. Uh-huh. Or probably Paul, Paul went to Sodom. There was one up there, too. How many schools were there all told? There were five districts. Five districts? Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. yeah. Now we have problem with North Canaan and Falls Village. <laughs> Canaan and North Canaan. That time, if you didn't, if you didn't come from Rose Hill, you know you didn't count. <laughs> so you, your world was really pretty, pretty uh, narrow geographically. If you oh, yeah. didn't go too far east without stretching, getting over the boundary, and you didn't talk to the kids from out at number five, no. it was pretty narrow. But it was a wonderful childhood. Well, I don't, I don't remember a really a bad experience. Uh, when I when I think back, uh, it was a good time. Now you uh, went through the first six grades. For six grades, mm -hmm. uh, first and second grade were downstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, third, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth upstairs. Mm -hmm. And boy, when you were an upstairs grader, you know that was quite an accomplishment. And then, um, after the sixth grade, of course, uh, you were transported to Canaan. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Trant was my seventh grade teacher. Oh, she was a teacher at that and time. And only the third teacher I had in my six years of school. Miss Hammond was the um, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And... Uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Brown, mm -hmm. her son the, was the minister. And mm -hmm. She was my uh, first and second grade teacher. Mm -hmm. It's funny, some of those teachers were still in place when I went through. Sure. Got all four of us. Yep. So they really stuck in... Can you imagine having time. the same teacher for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade? Well... Be a good thing if you got along with her at that rate. It was amazing uh, that uh, she would teach the third grade mm -hmm. for about an hour. We'd all be be given mm -hmm. assignments mm -hmm. and kept quiet while she was instructing the third grade. And then she'd move over and instruct the pupils mm -hmm. in the fourth, all in the same room. About how many kids would you say were in that area? Well, you know. I think there were five boys in the uh, Canaan seventh grade. North Canaan seventh. North grade and seventh grade when I went to, and there were several other girls, but I don't think there were more than uh, eight or ten at the most in the class. There was, I would imagine, yeah. there would be forty in one one room. With the whole four classes. Yeah. Wow. So you know. I can't imagine any teacher today, though, dealing with 40 kids in, in four different classes. Can you we imagine? had the cloak room, <laughs> the supply closet. And you were sent there, huh? <laughs> right. There was no light in the supply closet. Oh, wow. <laughs> and you went, you went to the supply closet. <laughs> Did that? And occasionally a ruler <laughs> was used across the knuckles. Oh. That was allowed at that time. And don't dare tell your parents that Miss Hammond scolded you during the day. You'd have trouble when you got home. Well, that's why my mother always said it was worse oh. to go home and say the teacher had to reprimand you than it was oh, to... Oh, no question. They didn't march on the school and complain in those days. Oh, that's, that's corporal punishment. <laughs> a thing of, yep. Almost a thing of the past. I guess it yes. still occurs yeah. occasionally. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Knuckles, a ruler across the knuckles that, you know, didn't mean a thing. Did it happen to you? No, thank goodness. No. <laughs> I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> Your father's gone. You can let us know. <laughs> right. Right. I can tell you now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It may have happened. <laughs> How did you get, get into the Canaan school? When, uh, when you graduated from sixth grade and started going in, into town, what kind of transport By did the you time have? I um, went to seventh grade, there was a bus. Uh, Mr. Wickwire mm -hmm. had uh, 
well, what it was, it was a long sedan. Mm -hmm. And he picked up the students at the school. Mm -hmm. Everybody, it was the responsibility of the student to get to the school. Down here at the East Canaan School. East Canaan School. school. Mm -hmm. And he would pick them all up uh, there in the East Canaan. Prior to that, I think really the children walked. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe my sisters uh, walked to school. And uh, from our house, I guess it was about a mile and a half. I think it was, that was one of the reasons why most of the students didn't bother going to 7th and 8th grade. Mm -hmm. I know in the case of my two older sisters, uh, the 6th grade, and that was it. They had to go to work to help support the family. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest sister went to work for... Um, uh, Mother and O'Neill. Uh, someone else owned that before, Mother and O'Neill. The name escapes me. It was on the corner of Fair's Drugstore. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that, before Mother and O'Neill? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, she went to work there, and my other sister, uh, at the t that tender age, went to New York City to work as a domestic. Wow. And uh, That would have been like... 13 years old, 12, 13 years old? Sure. Wow. You know, they were given room and board and a place to live, and they were domestic. And they so. they sent home money to help the family? Oh, yes. Sure. That was the, one of the reasons. Plus the fact going to, to Cana, I think, may have been uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. them. I can remember my older sister walking to work one very cold day, and uh, her legs were turned white, as I remember. Wow. So the treatment for that was to warm up onions to put on her leg. And I remember the onions burning her leg, and she carried that scar for the rest of her life. It was a oh home remedy word. that just didn't work, evidently. Wow. So, that, uh, so there's a lot of walking to do. And they say my dad drove, rode his bike mm -hmm. uh, to work every day. Mm -hmm. Do you have a bike when you were a kid? Oh, yes. I was one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. I don't think my mother had a bike. Hey, I was the uh, youngest in the family, so uh -huh. I was privileged, you might say. Uh, I was given the opportunity to continue uh, going to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think being the youngest in the family does have advantages because mm -hmm. everyone else is working to support the family and mm -hmm. help you uh, with clothes and mm -hmm. uh, going to school and things so that... Uh, oh, you were able to go on not only through high school but on to college. Yes, I was very fortunate uh, that I had help not only from my uh, sister who was not married, uh, who helped finance my college education, but uh, at that time, we had a curate at St. Joseph Church, Father McGurk, whose brother, and I never met uh, E.B. McGurk, who was a contractor in uh, Hartford. Uh, however, he uh, paid my tuition the uh, first year at uh, wow. Fordham University. Uh, of course, it was Father McGurk's recommendation, mm -hmm. but I thought it was very charitable of him to... Uh, you know, help someone who would, he had never met. Mm -hmm. And never did meet. And never did meet. No, I never met the gentleman. Uh, and uh, I had a job at the uh, bookstore in the university, and and that uh, they took finance two years of my education. Mm. And uh, the third year, my sister paid, and I figured, well, that was it. I wasn't going to obligate them to any more. Mm -hmm. uh, so you went through two years? I went to years. work thinking that I would raise and save enough money uh, to go back, but mm -hmm. uh, I never did go back. So what did you do then? Well, rather than continue my uh, college education, I went to uh, funeral director's mm -hmm. school for a year, got a funeral director's and an embalmer's license, mm -hmm. uh, passed the state boards, and uh, came to work for Roger Newkirk. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Canaan in uh, 1946. 
So you came back to Canaan uh, full-time then in 1946? 1946. And have been here pretty much ever since. Yes. <laughs> still home. And it, regardless of where I go, Canaan is still home. Now that's a long time in that position in, in one little community where you grew up and all your friends lived. Uh, what was that like for you, being here? When you live in paradise, Kathy, <laughs> why move here? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I just, I just enjoyed it here because, uh, you know, we made a lot of friends growing mm -hmm. up together. We were mm -hmm. all more or less in the same boat. We all same uh, uh, at the same level. Mm -hmm. We understood each other, had the mm -hmm. same problems, and the friendships were very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were more than friends, probably. We were all one big family. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any arguments between neighbors that uh, I can remember. Everybody seemed to get along so well. Uh, helping each other. Mm -hmm. I think that was the... You probably wouldn't have an argument with anybody because you'd lose some help somewhere along the line. But uh, <laughs> I think it would, everybody got seemed to get along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know my mother had uh, very close friends uh, that she uh, visited with quite often and uh, spend the afternoons with, and they all uh, got along very well. Now, your mom um, came from Italy, so did your dad. I presume Italian was the uh, primary language at home. Oh, yes. Uh, we always spoke Italian at home. Uh, and when I was, my mother took me back to Italy when I was five or six years old. In fact, I went to kindergarten, kin mm -hmm. kindergarten in Italy. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to this country, uh, I couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. I went to first grade with a real handicap. Mm -hmm. uh, but after my mom died, my dad, who worked every day and had to speak English, mm -hmm. and my sisters, uh, English became uh, the language of the of the household. And in fact, today I remember very little of the Italian, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can understand Italian, if someone speaks slowly, but uh, I couldn't, I can't speak Italian anymore. I have a problem with my English. <laughs> <laughs> Not so anyone would notice. <laughs> now, it, that must have, have meant, if your mother didn't, uh, didn't learn English, that she was um, pretty much confined to her own ethnic community. Was that the norm for the Italian families, uh, particularly the women? I think it was the, women, the uh, norm for women her age. Mm -hmm. um, the younger Italian women uh, learned English uh, and, and took an active part in the community. Mm -hmm. I know one of the little problems that I, I had when I was uh, going to school was that my mother didn't go to PTA. Uh -huh. But I understood why she couldn't go to PTA. But I felt all of the, some of the other students were represented, their parents were going to the PTA mm -hmm. and they were able to express themselves and, and speak up. And I know my mother couldn't do that, so that she didn't attend a PTA. And that was a little mm -hmm. bit of a problem for me. You know? you, did you feel a little isolated because I did. Of that? I, I think I did. I remember that. And I've spoken to other uh, people my age and they said the same thing, that they not necessarily embarrassed, but they felt a uh, uh, little short changed because their parents couldn't speak English. Uh -huh. And uh, they didn't want to speak Italian. They were embarrassed because they had to speak Italian. And uh, English was the, was the language that we were supposed to learn and that we were supposed to use as long as we were in this country. Mm -hmm. Did what you never um, felt any particular prejudice in this town that I, I think I've heard you say? No, fortunately, I, I never did. And however, I heard about individuals felt feeling that they were felt mm -hmm. prejudiced against, but um, they were different. Well, you would hear, well, gee, they don't hire Italians at the mm -hmm. power company or. Mm. Uh, but I, I never, I, I think I was helped by local people 
more than uh, even some of the Italian families, uh, Alan Fuller, uh, Fred Hall, Dr. Farnham. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they all they offered me uh, work, uh, good advice uh, when I needed it, and I think they helped me. And I, uh, I appreciate it, even to this day. My first job was the drugstore, so I got my education in Farnham's Drugstore. <laughs> <laughs> was then I preceded... No, was your dad ahead of me in Fuller Hardware? Uh, dad was there after no, Bob, the war. After. Yeah. I was there before your dad. Uh, Bob Thompson, I believe, uh, was ahead of me in Fuller Hardware. Mm -hmm. Then I went to work at Fuller Hardware to work for Fred and Mr. Fuller. I don't know where... Oh, Dad was down at Pratt & Whitney oh, before the time? war. Oh. He worked down there, and then after mm -hmm. he came back and, and had all of us, he settled down <laughs> had <laughs> to make a living. Fuller, so yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that was his fate after the war. Um, the uh, When you were in school, you did you ever feel any... Um, pressure there be other than your mother's lack of involvement in, in the PTA? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No. I think some of the other uh, children did. There may have been a little bit of ill feeling between the students. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, you know, or during an argument in a ball game, you would be called a guinea or a dago or uh, this sort of thing. But mm -hmm. uh, I think we understood that it was in the heat of an argument, and uh, it was just an expression that was used. I didn't really feel offended being called a guinea. Occasionally there would be someone that would call you a guinea, and you knew that they meant it. Mm -hmm. But most of the time there was, oh, you guinea, you know, or yeah. you garlic eater or some kind of thing. You know? <laughs> but uh, I think it was a lot of it was said in jest, and a lot uh -huh. of it was sit under pressure so you didn't I didn't it didn't bother, seem to bother me as much mm -hmm. some people were more sensitive perhaps than I might have been so well, I think perhaps you felt better about yourself than than other people might have and, and that tends to deflect a lot if you feel okay about yourself to this day I'm proud of being Italian yeah my children are Italian their mother is Irish and German but my, my children all only claim to be Italian really? that's it <laughs> for some reason I don't know and I don't. What difference does it make? Yep. But I, I'm still very proud of my heritage. I figured, well, my parents came from Italy. They, they worked up from absolutely nothing, yep. and I'm, I benefited from it. Mm -hmm. I didn't work as hard as they did. I never did. Uh, so that I appreciate what they went through. I think we're all lucky we didn't have to work as hard as our oh, parents did. <laughs> God, how they worked. Mm. Maybe that's one of our problems today. I don't know. What, in what way? We don't work anymore. We don't know what manual labor is. We don't appreciate work. Well, uh, I think probably we spend too much time looking for things to be easy. You know, I, yeah. I think probably uh, there's much too much emphasis on how well off we can be. And that doesn't necessarily equate to happiness. You know, um, but work is uh, so important. In fact, I still have a, uh, of a, a guilt feeling about not working hard. The word lazarun, which means a lazy one, mm -hmm. that's a terrible label to be a lazarun. You know, there were some people that were lazaruns, and yeah. that's, oh, that was terrible to be lazy. But, uh, you know, I, I think everybody loved each other. And well, you worked hard enough, heaven knows. You were not a funeral, a funeral hours, director, not, and you were tax collector, and uh, you were... You I was worked. an insurance agent for the Knights of Columbus. They were all... And I worked at the, as a guard at the mag plant, but they were... That's because you had a lot of children. Right? Yeah. You had four or five mothers to feed. You've got to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> but no manual labor, really. No manual. I worked about two weeks for a contractor, and I figure this is it. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be a better way to earn a living. <laughs> well, I think you found it. <laughs> let's let's talk a little bit about your your work career. Um, you your primary job was, of course, at the funeral home. Yes. And um, I think I've heard you say along the line that that the uh, over the years there were changes in the um, mores, the uh, customs. Yeah. Oh yes. Local burials. I decided uh, 
change. When I went to work at the funeral home, uh, well, for example, wakes, everyone, everyone had a wake. And it was, uh, some of the wakes were held at the home. The mm -hmm. body was brought to the individual's home and they would wait for a minimum of two days. Uh, from, and it was, in many cases, oh, someone would have to be with the body overnight. And the body was never left alone really? uh, for a two-day period, and then the funeral would be held, held on the third day. Would that be a person be from the, the funeral home that, that stayed the night, or a family member? Oh, or? probably be a family member. Uh -huh. Although I do remember some uh, couple of cases where people came from out of town, and they were professional mm -hmm. mourners mm -hmm. that would come and uh, read either the Bible or... Uh, uh, scriptures uh, all night long, but they would be people who the family probably didn't even know. Really? And they were professional mourners that would come and uh, spend the night with the body while the family tried to get some rest. And gradually, the wakes went to the funeral home, and I think the funeral director encouraged this. Mm -hmm. uh, he built a funeral home, so he had to get some rent after spending the money to build the funeral home, so he encouraged the people to come to the funeral home to have their wake so he could charge them a little bit more for the use of the funeral home and the <laughs> and the equipment and everything else. When was uh, the funeral home built? This funeral home that was there now was built about 1935, I believe. The original funeral home, a wooden structure, burned down. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had an uncle who did the masonry work on the present uh, mm -hmm. funeral home. Uh, Lawrence Rinaldi built the funeral home, and he was a, ma a bricklayer for Lawrence Rinaldi. Mm -hmm. So uh, then they moved down to the funeral parlor, and then they became more what we know today? Yes, I think now the traditional uh, wake, as we know it, is at the funeral home. Uh, even the embalming procedure, I've had the experience of going to a home and mm -hmm. uh, embalming the body. The body, the family refused to have the remains taken out of the house. So the body would have to be embalmed in the house, encased in a casket, a wake held, and the funeral held right at the home wow. before going to the cemetery. That must have been so difficult to it was very difficult. in the home. Very difficult. Kind of shield uh, them to, from the realities. You had to move the preparation room, you might say, or the operating room to the person's house. You had suitcases you had to lug in, you know, with, with instruments and chemicals and everything else. And it was very difficult. Yeah. Thank God they changed that. <laughs> that can't happen by law anymore, can it? Do they have to remove the body from the premises? Uh, it's very possible because um, the embalming rooms are all state inspected mm -hmm. several times a year. Mm -hmm. And I would assume, yes, that uh, you couldn't have it at home anymore. Hmm. Although I don't think the state would have refused anyone. As long as it was done properly. As long as it was done properly. Uh, I've been noticing lately, as I do obituaries, that more and more families are now having a memorial service sometime after the disposition of the body has taken place so that there is, in essence, no real public mourning session. It's... Um, and some some of them I've been to have been rather uplifting. But what do you think of that process? Do you do you think that that serves the same function as the old funeral, or is that not quite as effective? It all depends on why the family of the deceased individual makes that decision. I can remember when that trend first started. Uh, I really think it began in the uh, well often referred to as the intellectual community, I guess, college towns, prep school mm -hmm. towns. Mm -hmm. uh, the people uh, did away with the so-called wake. I think the wake and the funeral is a, would you say, ethnic ceremony? No, well, it can uh, be. You know, uh, so that when we started to get away from the uh, ethnic customs, I think, we're moving more towards the no calling hours, memorial service, cremation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fine as long as the individual is not doing it to deny 
what has actually happened. And mm -hmm. that I see happens in some cases mm -hmm. where the family, uh, once a death takes place, uh, just doesn't want anything to do with the final arrangements here. Take it out, mm -hmm. every uh, service, and that's it. That's my mm -hmm. only obligation. And and that does happen. And I think that uh, individual is makes the wrong decision because they're not ex accepting a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And they may have a little problem getting over the mourning period uh, uh, that is always a difficult one. Even as a funeral director, I don't think the elaborate uh, wake and funeral is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's barbaric, but I mm -hmm. do think it's a little more basic and uh, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. I think a memorial service is, can be just as comforting and satisfying to the bereaved as the... Uh, Old-fashioned wake uh, used to be. I'm not sure the wake is comforting. It's <laughs> it was the toughest part of my father's um, the visiting hours. It wasn't, yeah. I guess, a wake, but that was the hardest part of the whole thing in my mind to to go through that. So, but it, I also think it was uh, for us kind of a definitive process. He was gone. I never really mm -hmm. believed it until I walked in there. That's it. And you, know, you have to face it. Yeah. At some time. Uh, you know, Kathy, you say it was very difficult. I, and I've had gee, deaths in my family, too. And I have always found it very difficult. So for me, the wake didn't serve as a healing, as a healing process. There are some people that need this. Mm. And that's why I say it's up to the individual mm. on what type of service they have, what type of service they feel would help in the healing process. Mm. Uh, I don't care for wakes myself when I have to be there with my own members of the mm -hmm. family. As a fa funeral director, I shouldn't be saying this. I should be su <laughs> supporting the wake. But I honestly don't feel that way. If a family wants the traditional wake, fine. Uh -huh. I was, as a funeral director, I was very willing to go through that. Yeah. And I, but I think the same uh, way that if someone said, I only want uh, a memorial service, uh, I was never tried to talk them out of it. Yeah. Uh, I would do whatever the family felt was in, in their best interest. Yeah. So. Well, it's it's certainly a, a situation that's changing dramatically. And I, as I said, I do the obituaries every week. So um, each week it, I'll, I'll run into a variety of different arrangements being mm -hmm. made. And I think the hardest one uh, is when, it, what appears to me to be the hardest one, is when they say no, no calling hours. All services private. No, no flowers. <laughs> and right. there are people outside the family who care too. Mm -hmm. And um, right. I, I remember the father of a best friend dying, and it was all private. And I, even as her, Jane's best friend, I couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And I never felt like I had said goodbye to Jim. That's right. You know? And when you see the family for the first time, it's very difficult. And what do I say? Do I mm -hmm. express? my condolences uh, do they want to ignore the fact mm -hmm. do they want to discuss it it does make it very difficult mm -hmm. for friends uh, true uh, and the wake did serve that purpose yep. even if it uh, they served drinks and food and everything mm -hmm. else and they had a little party but mm -hmm. it did give the everyone the opportunity to get together mm -hmm. and either laugh or cry and or express their emotions uh, so that uh, the memorial service, uh, I think, does help. Uh, and I like the new trend where the family is taking part mm -hmm. in the memorial service. Mm -hmm. I think it's getting back to uh, assuming the responsibilities of accepting death mm -hmm. uh, for what it is. Mm -hmm. It's final, and you might just as well go through it because mm -hmm. it's, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Whether you accept it or not, you, did you you speak of serving food and drinks and whatnot? Were there was there a wide diversity in the kind of cultural um, uh, input that went into funerals in Canaan? Oh yes, yes. I when I can remember going to wakes where the liquor was flowing, the food was being served, and uh, people were staying twelve one o'clock. The poor family was serving everyone, <laughs> oh, you know, geez. and it would even to the point where you went. You went so far as to have caterers there, either at the wake or 
the day of the funeral. You'd have to cater to the people who attend in the services. My word. Uh, I've been to a service, uh, a, p- uh, not a party, I don't want to call it a party, <laughs> a reception, <laughs> but after the funeral at the White Hart Inn, for example, uh, where everyone would be invited to the White Hart for refreshments. So they did give the opportunity for an, and a little lighter vein mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for people to get together. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people came long distances. People don't go long distances mm-hmm. anymore to attend funerals for some reason. They send a card. Yeah. Uh, but in those days, it was important for everyone to get together. Uh-huh. Mm. Well, that's interesting. A time of gathering. Mm. Well, it's actually as important in the long run as a wedding or a birth. I mean, it, it's a, another major adjustment in a family life. Yeah. And... Uh, it can't be minimized, no, <laughs> at least. No, so it's a fact of life. Yeah. On the other side of death, we had taxes. <laughs> How did a nice guy like you get into two fields like that? <laughs> to, to, to add to that, in nineteen, I think it was in the early nineteen fifties, uh, I was elected justice of the peace, mm-hmm. so that I had the privilege of marrying people. So. <laughs> Everybody would joke about marrying them and burying them and collecting their taxes, you know. <laughs> Couldn't avoid me. Gee. <laughs> that was another part, Kathy, that I enjoyed very much, being a justice of the peace and Canaan being the marrying center of the state of Connecticut. Uh-huh. Uh, the laws in New York State uh, did not allow for Nevada... Uh, or out-of-state divorces. Mm -hmm. So the people had to come, anyone from New York State who was divorced had to come to Connecticut to get married. Mrs. Whitehouse had a lab where she would do the blood test. Uh, The judge of probate would issue waivers and the justice (laughs) of the peace would be available uh, for marrying so that you could actually get married in Connecticut in a matter of two or three hours. Wow. <laughs> and we did a rushing business. We, I think at one time we're up to four or five hundred weddings a year wow. in the town of North Canaan. And most of them on weekends, so that we're very busy. Uh, there were several justices that would be on call every weekend, and we were very busy. Uh, I've had uh, occasions where cars were lined up. Uh, at my house, waiting in turn to get married. That is amazing. Who was Mrs. Whitehouse? Mrs. Whitehouse was a, a technician who lived in Ashley Falls who had a uh, laboratory, uh, what is now known as the um, Farnham Building. It was uh-huh. above Farnham's drugstore. Uh huh. And, of course, in the state of Connecticut, you have to have a blood test yeah. before you get married. Well, she would do the blood test in her lab. And just give you the results right away. And just give the results almost within the, within the hour. In the meantime, the individual would be making out a application uh, for a license at the town hall. Uh, there would be some reason for them to get a waiver. Normally, you have to wait three days in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. But with a waiver, you can get married in the same day. So the judge of probate issued a waiver. <laughs> and uh, here we go, another wedding. <laughs> It, it must have gotten kind of old hat as you went along and did that many marriages in the course oh, of a yes. day. Although they were, although they were, you know, we enjoyed it. We met a lot of nice people. I uh, had a difficult experience. It, we had one couple that I married that lifted my wallet and took $250. Oh, no! <laughs> and uh, I know one occasion that uh, a gentleman came to the, in an old pickup truck to my house during the week and said, uh, Judge, did uh, you marry so-and-so this weekend? I said, yes. And uh, he says, gee, you, uh, Judge, you that was my wife and my daughter's boyfriend that you married. I said, oh, my God, bigamy. I said, I'll call the police. Oh, no, he says, that's why I'm here, Judge. I don't want you to do, do anything because I still love her. <laughs> oh, poor man. <laughs> Poor fellow. <laughs> Did you learn they that? They were arrested, by the way, and, uh, <laughs> for bigamy. Uh, but I had no way of knowing that they were married. They they swear to, uh, on the, 
you know, on, on the marriage license. That, uh, they, and in the marriage ceremony, you tell them that if there was any reason, uh, legal reason, that they should not be united, united in marriage, that the present ceremony is illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that covers the justice of the peace. <laughs> How long were you a JP? How many years? Oh boy, almost forty years! Wow, that's got to be early fifties. That's got to be a lot of until marriages. Until I became sixty-five. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, what uh, ten years ago, New York State changed their marriage laws, mm -hmm. and Mrs. Ho Whitehouse closed her lab. Mm -hmm. For a while, we used uh, a lab in West Hartford, mm -hmm. but that meant that the couple had to drive to West Hartford, mm -hmm. and as long as they were driving to West Hartford, they might just well get married there. Yeah. So that. Uh, it dwindled down to now, on well, the last few years, all I did was local weddings. Mm -hmm. Now, and as far as local weddings, I got a lot of satisfaction out of, in some cases, uh, conducting funeral services for someone, and then a year or two later, have the widow or widower call me uh -huh. and say, gee, Henry, I'm getting married again. Would you perform the ceremony? Oh, isn't that nice? And I was so flattered that that, that would happen, and that's just happened uh, several times. Yeah, that I thought, gee, that's wonderful. I I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. It's kind of a nice ending to a sad story. Yes, yes, I was so happy that uh, uh, that they from Canaan. So yes. you were in Canaan at the time he was a oh, senior yes. and and graduating. Yep. Yeah. That was. He's one of those. He's one of those brains. He was too. <laughs> was he? Oh, jeez. I remember his report uh, cards. Yeah, <laughs> they were good, weren't they? they had to. No. Oh, you no. give the impression that he was. He was in my class, but you no, know, he knew what he was talking about most of the time. Well, we were we were always very smart, but none of us ever studied. And <laughs> he was he was never in a position to say anything to any of us. Oh. <laughs> my mother went to school with a mountain park college and uh -huh. and she used to tell about his 8 30 class that he never got up for <laughs> <laughs> and, you know dad's academic yeah. career was just exactly like mine no we looked up to him as i remember it boy he's smart yes of course makes a difference everything's relative you know? yeah <laughs> kids from east canaan weren't very smart <laughs> <laughs> well the ones you grow up with are never smart you well, know that. well that's probably it <laughs> yeah was but, there a uh, lot of trouble melding all of those kids together when they finally got into one school? Uh, yes, I, I think there was a little a problem. We have a we had a tendency of uh, sticking together because we came from East Canaan, mm -hmm. and there was always that rivalry between Canaan and East Canaan uh, in sports, athletic events. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was a certain uh, there was a certain rivalry there. Mm -hmm. The I think the students in Canaan were. Uh, more advanced at that point you think than so? we were. Well, we had the we didn't have the advantage of having a teacher for each class, mm -hmm. or even two teachers sometimes for each mm -hmm. class, moving from the portables to the main building and mm -hmm. this sort of thing. You know, we were in one room school. Uh, I think Miss Hammond did uh, as well as would be expected, trying to teach four classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, all day long. Mm, that was really combat duty, actually. Yeah, it was, must have been very difficult, you know. And that probably, and then there were some students that we felt held were held back mm -hmm. so that she had to uh, keep the level of instructions to the point where she would be teaching the less fortunate students with mm -hmm. the more, uh, you know, mm -hmm. was it, uh, a little more capable. So I uh, yes I do think that we were a little behind the mm -hmm. students in in Canaan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody in East Canaan would admit that, but I think it was the truth. <laughs> well, they'll all know that you think this shortly. <laughs> That'll be worse than having your father find out about the knuckles. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, uh, okay. Well, you came into um, into Canaan for the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. and then finished out the eighth. Now, you did not go to Canaan High, right? Yes, I did one you year. You did? Freshman okay. year. Um, Mr. Richardson was the principal, and we didn't go to regional until our sophomore year. Mm -hmm. We were the second class to graduate from 
uh, Housatonic Valley Regional. Okay. And now your dad was in the... Dad graduated in 39 from this school, this school. in Canaan. And your mom was in his class? No, she was uh, She was the first graduating class out of... With Doretta Beaupre yeah. and yeah. Henry Belter and that mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, they were one year ahead of us. The high school in Canaan was on the top floor, is that correct? Yes. And we didn't have the big fire escapes out front that, that were there when you, you saw that were torn down. Uh -huh. The only entrance was out back. And up three and flights? And upstairs. It was up three the flight flights, of stairs. Right? Yes, there were three flights of stairs. And uh, the eighth grade was a, uh, a second level. Mm -hmm. There was the lower level, mm -hmm. and then the seventh grade, and the eighth grade was by itself in the corner. And then upstairs on the third floor uh, was the high school, uh -huh. the chemistry lab, physics lab. Uh, some of that was in the basement, too. No dirty, dingy, smelly basement. Some of the classes had to be held down there. Really? Sure. I didn't know that. Yeah, some of the uh, science classes uh -huh. were held in the basement. And then if we had any extracurricular activities, uh, stamp, stamp club or anything like that, they were also held in the basement mm -hmm. uh, after school. Mm -hmm. So that. Uh, How many classrooms were in that building, do you remember? Oh, I don't remember. I can visualize it, but I just, uh, I could count them, I suppose. Yeah. But no, I don't remember. I can remember being on the second floor, I think. Uh, I think second grade. I only went through, no, I went through third grade there. Um, the second floor was must have been third grade. Mm -hmm. And the first grade was out in the portables, and then second grade, and then one flight up for third. And the big windows, I always remember the big windows looking out on the street. Oh, on the street? Yeah. 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 It was a pretty school in its yeah. way. It was. It was. And I like the creaky floors. You don't get creaky there floors. There were and creepy floors. Yeah. Oil soaked. <laughs> Just think yeah. how that thing would have burned had you guys ever been on the third floor. You oh, would have been trapped. Oh, no. And there was oil on the floors. That's how they cleaned the floors. Just mm -hmm. poured oil on them. Can you mm -hmm. imagine if they ever caught fire? Wow. Just a mm. fire trap. That school was taken down in 54, is that right? Gee, I don't remember that either. I don't remember the date. But I remember when it was taken down and the new school was built. Uh, the town hall go down first? No, I think the town hall was after, after the school. Oh, the it town hall was where we had our athletic yes. activities: basketball, uh, Christmas pageants. Uh, the windows were just covered with, with chicken wire. <laughs> <laughs> So if you were forced up against the chicken wire, you had to go out and get the Band-Aids. Wow. And I understand they had a big stove under Pot bellied stove right there in the middle. So you didn't want to get too close to that. It must have kind of impeded the flow of play if, if you had this stove. It probably <laughs> did, but if you did, it never knew anything any better, you didn't know. You didn't realize it. You thought it was, what a big place. It was certainly a lot better than we had in East Canaan because we didn't have anything in East Canaan. So that uh, when you know, would was you a big improvement. When would you have started playing there? When you came into school as after-school sports or something like that? In, in, ba in, in basketball? basketball? yeah. Yes, and we were allowed to use it on weekends, too. Mm -hmm. did, did the kids from East Canaan come into Canaan much as a, uh, for recreation? No, there actually wasn't a need, need for it. We had everything here. We had swimming in the river mm -hmm. up here in Ben Rock. Uh, skating on the river, mm -hmm. uh, so the river served the purpose for two seasons. You know, we had our baseball uh, diamonds, and we played football. We played uh, well, just about everything that mm -hmm. we and we had our own teams. We had enough uh, young people mm -hmm. that uh, took part. That, uh, in fact, we had games between Canaan and uh, East Canaan. Mm -hmm. I think East Canaan always won. <laughs> I don't think we were ever beat. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when we went to school in Canaan, they, I think they kind of mixed in everything. We may have of been. course, Borden's Pond was a great place yeah. to go to. Yeah, my mother always friends. tells about Borden's Pond. Uh, that, was, that was the greatest place. Yes. And if we could find transportation, we would come down. Mom always talks about... Uh, 
I, I can't get over this because right now in this litigious society that we've created, nobody would ever allow this to happen, but one end of it would be open where they were harvesting ice and yep. the town's children would be skating on the other end of it. Yep. And nobody seemed to consider that that was a uh, particularly dangerous situation. No. Nobody considered that the pot-bellied stove in the middle of the town hall would be any kind of danger to kids playing ball. No. In this day and age, no one would let that happen. No, no. Uh, and I, in fact, I think if you fell in at Borden's, you wouldn't go down very far. Anyway, I don't mm -hmm. think there's much water in that pond. And occasionally someone did fall in. Uh, same way with the river. Mm -hmm. you know? The river was much higher, by the way, than it is now. Much higher. When the dams were here, there was a series. Well, I think, I think two dams have been blown up. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're the foundation for two dams, mm -hmm. yeah. So that the water was much higher up uh, on the other end, so that we were able to swim and, mm -hmm. and skate a lot more. Mm -hmm. It wasn't considered to be a, a hazard, though. No. Mm -hmm. We used to burn tires for heat. They wouldn't allow you to burn the tires today. No, Mom always said they had a, a big bonfire on the edge of Borden's Pond in the sure. afternoon and all the kids. She said if you were anybody, you had to be there after school. Oh, no, that, was a, that was a place to go, right. In fact, we felt pretty good about being able to go down there. You uh -huh. know, it, uh, it was the place to be and met a lot of friends. And of course, the Canaan guys were competition, too, you know, the girls. <laughs> gave us a lot of problems. They were a little more sophisticated than we were, you know. And <laughs> well, you were better sports. I mean, you well, won the ball games. Well, that doesn't go on all games, as you know. <laughs> the girls didn't go for the jocks. Uh, not necessarily. We were old hat, you know. The, the boys from Canaan were. Hmm, they were the ones they were really interested <laughs> in. <laughs> and we resented that boy. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that this Canaan, East Canaan thing was really serious. Oh, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what happened when you got to high school and, and the competition got even fiercer? Uh, well, you know, it took a few years, really, mm -hmm. for everyone to mesh, the basketball teams to gel. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sharon players would play amongst themselves, Canaan, mm -hmm. uh, Lakeville. Uh, uh, well, we found that, yes, for the first few years, it was a little bit of a problem getting them to getting things to gel. Mm -hmm. Now I don't think there's any question. No. It doesn't make any difference what town you come from. Mm. Which is probably a lesson in life too, don't you think? Yeah. I bet we can get along with the Arabs just as well as the East Canaan could get along with Canaan if we made our minds. Well, you uh, notice so. that the Russians and the United States are going oh, to... Oh, they were buddies now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're going to spend the weekend together. <laughs> My house or yours. <laughs> yeah. All right. Ah. It's amazing, isn't it? I bet Mr. Mrs. and Mrs. are going to get along a lot better, too, you know? <laughs> it's all selfishness. God. Yep. Shame. So how are we doing? I think we're...